We're recording. Okay. Take it away, Jason. All right, let's get going. Um, hi, folks. I'm uh, Jason Pramus, and uh, tonight I'm uh, I'm wearing my Society of Professional Journalists hat, and uh, I'd like to wel welcome Representative Laurie Ehrlich to this uh, conversation we're going to have tonight about the new Massachusetts Journalism Commission law. Um, and um, why don't we just start with introductions first? And I thought it'd be good if we both introduce ourselves. So representative, why don't you tell us who you are and what okay. you do? I, I, can, I can definitely handle that. Um, hi everyone who's tuned in and attending. Uh, my name is Lori Ehrlich. I'm from Marblehead. I've been a state rep for 13 years, just celebrated my 13th anniversary. Um, I am the original filer of the journalism commission uh, bill which um, is now actually codified in state law and is up and running. So, or almost up and running. Um, it's forming as we speak, but um, I've been in this, in this role doing all kinds of bills, um, but this one is particularly um, important and timely and also personal um, for reasons I'll explain maybe as we start chatting. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, even in the short two years that I've, filed this bill, I've noticed changes. So there's no time like the present. So I'm thrilled to work with Jason. And Jason, thank you for inviting me today. Um, you've been um, a partner throughout this. And it's been really great to have your insight attached to this. And um, now, hopefully soon, your participation in the commission. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks very much, Representative. Um, and of course, none of us would be here if you hadn't filed the bill, thought of the bill, done all the work. So thank you so much for doing it. And I'm glad we're at the point we're at now, um, which is discussing a victory and like moving forward from it rather than going, how can we get it passed in the next session? You know, like which would have been a drag. Um, so I'm Jason Pramus again. I um, wear, uh, aside from my Society of Professional Journalists um, hat, I, um, uh, I have jobs and I, I um, uh, run a couple of uh, journalism organizations with my colleagues, Chris Verone and John Loftus. I'm uh, executive editor and associate publisher of Dig Boston, which is a, a independent metropolitan newspaper uh, serving Boston low these last 22 years. And my colleagues and I have, uh, have, have uh, owned it for four almost now in June. And then um, for six years, uh, the three of us have also run uh, a nonprofit, the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. Um, and I'm executive director now of that organization. And it's with kind of that hat that I, I did the legislative work um, with Representative Ehrlich and a bunch of other folks to, to get this passed. Uh, the, the Mass Journalism Commission law, I guess we style it in brief, although that's not the, the official title has changed a number of times um, as we'll discuss. So um, why don't we just start at the beginning? I, I think that's the, the best way to go, Representative Ehrlich. Um, with, um, you know, the the crisis in, in, in local journalism in Massachusetts and of course in the nation, like what, what were some of the sign, signs you were seeing, you know, that were making you concerned in the years leading up to your deciding to file a bill um, to deal with the problem? Yeah, I mean, the, the early issues for me were very um, personal, just my own observations uh, growing up um, my, my parents always, um, they, we would get um, several newspapers delivered to the house. We would all sit around, read and discuss the news. Um, Sundays were for all hanging out, reading the Sunday Times and doing the crossword puzzle. I mean, newspapers are, were very much always a part of my life. Um, and, I, and now that I'm a rep, um, it, it, it's absolutely essential <laughs> that I keep up, um, especially on the local news. So I started to notice, you know, it, and, in my part of the state, um, where we do have several newspapers, I started to notice that the papers were getting trimmer and um, there was less content, uh, actually even less ads because the, ad, it, it's the, the ads started to dry up. Um, but I, I started to notice that the papers were trimming down. And also I you know, realized one day that one person was writing the entirety of um, my local paper, and then also also writing the entirety of another, um, the city next door. So it just, you know, I, I, I and, and he's wonderfully talented, but um, still it's one person and you can't cover everything. So there's 
there's just my own observations. And then also realizing that I rely on local news, not only to stay up on what's going on, but nobody can really get to every school committee meeting, every public um, public event to every everything. So we count on our journalists to attend these things and report back so we can be informed. And you know, it's really on a very local level, it's, it's part of what makes our democracies function. So if we have, we, we're not getting the news as to what is, um, you know, what's happening, then we're less informed and we may not know, you know, what the issues are or who to vote for or whatever, or, or you know, to get viewpoints. Um, so I started to feel it, it was diminished. I felt diminished myself, but I started to realize that it, this was part of a bigger problem. And luckily, you know, one, one of the um, terms that we see used often now is news deserts. And a news desert is like a, um, it's a community that doesn't have any local newspaper. So I'm certainly not in that situation because um, I, I do have local papers even still. But there are many news deserts popping up around the country. Um, we have entire communities, entire counties that don't have a single newspaper. Right. Um, so, you know, so all the things that I was missing or, or, you know, maybe appreciating at the time, but thinking, you know, what would it be like if we didn't have this? There are places that don't have any news. So what that means, I think, is, you know, just a diminishment. It's a, it's a, I don't know, it tears at the fabric of the community, I think, if you, if you're not celebrating the birth of a baby or, you know, uh, figuring out, you know, what to do this weekend or, you know, what, what's going on in the community. Um, but also just the, the news gathering function. I think if nobody's out there gathering these stories, there's lost is that ability to hold power accountable. And, you know, as an elected person, I, I realized that it's unusual <laughs> for, for somebody to feel that way as an elected person. But yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's how our democracy functions. We have to be able to hold power accountable. But, and when I say power, it's not just elected power. I think it's, it's all power. If, um, you know, if, if nobody's asking the questions, I, I would think that, you know, power is unchecked. Um, and that's a dangerous situation for our our country and our communities. So, so that is that was the impetus behind filing this bill. And when I filed it, it was um, very much, you know, just like what can we do? Um, I was not. At, I wrote it from scratch. Um, I was not aware of anything going on in other states. Um, apparently there was something going on in New Jersey that I didn't know about. Um, yeah, which we can discuss a little right. later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we can we can talk about that a little bit more. But um, other than that, we're the first we're the first state to take this approach. So yeah. originally it was like we could say, well, okay, we want this to happen and we want that to happen, and this is what the journalist industry should do. <laughs> And I kind of stepped back and thought, well, who am I to tell the journalist industry <laughs> what it should do or how it should solve these problems? So, um, and especially being in government, I think that's something that, you know, you, you don't really want your elected officials um, meddling in, in the business of journalism. So the approach that I took was to form a commission and it seemed like sort of a light touch, um, but also deeply meaningful. And the idea was to get experts in the room. Um, the commission is made up of 23 individuals. Um, and originally it was fewer. Um, and Jason took an active role in <laughs> increasing the number, which was great because even now I can't just, just forming this commission. There's so much enthusiasm and so much interest in participating in this commission that 23 isn't even enough. Um, but it's at a 23 and they're, they're, they, they come from academia, industry, um, you know, the journalism industry, they, they're reporters, they're editors, they're publishers, um, union members. Um, we have, we, 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 you know, uh, there, there's also several um, organizations that bring in diversity mm. and there's, um, there's lots of uh, just open seats for interest. People who are really excited about this. So um, the seats went quickly, um, but that was, that was the, that, that, that was the construction of the bill. 
Um, getting it through the legislature was not without its challenges. Um, we don't pass all that many bills in a normal session, but with COVID, uh, every all policy practically, unless it was COVID re related, was pushed off. So normally we end July 31st um, on, in the second year of a session, and we didn't actually end until January of the following year. So this year, 2021. Right. So everything was pushed off and I got it in very late at night and you know really attached to something else. <laughs> and um, we did it. Um, so now, now the, the fun of actually um, creating it um, is, is before us. Um, one, for anybody who's um, watching this, if you want to read up on this issue, um, this, this sort of came over my transom um, as I was uh, writing the bill. Um, the Hussman School of Journalism at University of North Carolina came out with a report, and they've since updated it. And I think they've actually updated it four times in the last 10 years, I think. Um, and that report delves into the idea of news deserts and the state of the industry um, really well. And they do, and they update it. So it kind of each time they update it, it gives a snapshot of what, um, what the state of the industry is. And they reported on, um, you know, the, the findings are pretty grim. Uh, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of consolidation right now. Um, COVID certainly took its toll on journalism. Um, ad dollars have dried up uh, thanks to, you know, Google and um, Facebook. Um, a lot of the ad dollars are online now. Um, you know, journalism is kind of in rough shape. Um, a lot of the local papers are feeling it the worst. Um, here we have, you know, so many um, of the wicked locals are, I don't even know who they're owned by now, Jason, who- who are owned by um, <clears throat> um, yeah. Alden Global Capital, Alden which Global Capital. has eaten up uh, both digital first media that used to own it and Tribune, you know, Tronk so-called, you know, uh, they just got full control of Tribune in February. So they're huge, yeah. And it's, then- It's a little hard to keep track of all the purchases because, you know, you, you see your local journalist, I see, um, you know, the reporter around town and it's like, who owns you now? <laughs> Just, yeah. You know, and now it's, it's gotten to the point now where this all, Alden Global Capital is a hedge fund yeah. and it's just um, consumed so much of the nation's um, local news and some major papers as well. So, so we're looking at, you know, the, it, you know, I don't want to attach good or bad to that um, because if they want to um, make the news flourish, um, all the power to them, but we've seen a lot of consolidation. So um, in Massachusetts, some of, you know, communities have been merged together. So where they had three newspapers, now there's one regional paper. Yep. Um, we see, you know, uh, um, staff being laid off and uh, journalists being laid off. And that's happening at the larger papers too. We're very lucky, you know, to have, um, you know, still two papers for better or worse them um, in town. Um, so that's actually uh, rare now to have two city newspapers. Um, but we are, you know, we, we pay for our subscriptions here in Massachusetts and we appreciate the journalism. Um, and so far it's survived. But, um, you know, it's the local stuff I'm pretty much focused on, really the local papers, which is, you know, it, it's the fabric of our communities. That it's where we tell the stories of who we are and, uh, and where we're going. So um, and maybe one thing, you know, we're going to look at, um, I mean, the commission will look at early on, uh, we're, we're waiting for the, um, the chair of, uh, of um, the committee from which the, or the law emerged, right? Uh, community development and small businesses to determine the final composition of the commission right now. I guess that will be happening soon. Um, but once that happens, I mean, the commission is going to be looking at, for example, like we, <laughs> It's difficult to even know what publications are surviving in Massachusetts and, and who owns them. That's gonna take us a bit, not a lot of time. I mean, take, take, take the commission a lot of time to figure this out, but it's important. Like Gannett is where I think we're gonna find is the, is the biggest owner of local news outlets in the state, but Alden also owns you know, a number. 
and uh, that numbers well the number they own is is growing both these kinds of conglomerates but the numbers of papers in massachusetts is shrinking we had just lost over a couple dozen papers from the uh, Gannett Gatehouse merger the year before the pandemic started to kill off other papers. Um, and Alden particularly is notorious. I mean, Gannett's not great either, um, but Alden's really uh, notorious for squeezing newsrooms, just you know, really trying to get all the ad, ad money they can. And they don't, you know, they don't care about journalism at all, as far as we can tell. Um, and they own some some famous papers, you know, around the U.S. And a lot of staff have been cut. Um, in Massachusetts, it's interesting because our, you know, sort of the flagship paper of our news ecology is the Boston Globe, and they're owned by you know a billionaire right now. Um, whether that continues to be the case, we we don't know. Hearing rumblings that it may not may not be the case, <laughs> but but. Um, that that is sort of even though there's been major cuts there, you know, dozens of staff have been, you know, um, pensioned off or or just eliminated over the last few years. But um, they still are the biggest, and they 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 do a tremendous amount of reporting, right? Um, if we lose that outlet, or if it really diminishes and becomes like some of these other ones, gets hollowed out more. It, it will be very bad for the entire region because everybody depends usually on the top paper, you know, including TV to like figure, you know, to figure out what, I mean, every, every news outlet in the region usually looks to the top one, the big one, the big newspaper almost always that, that has, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of reporters working every day, putting stuff out uh, and looking at things in depth. Whereas TV news doesn't have that luxury, radio news doesn't have that luxury, right, usually. Although NPR is probably the second biggest newsroom in the Boston area, and they, you know, with about at least 100 reporters, I think, uh, or staff in general terms, and um, uh, but they're not as big as the Globe. And if it was just NPR, if it was just WBUR, you know, as the as the, you know, the the only big newsroom in the city, because the Herald is really almost gone, mm -hmm. um, there we would have a real problem. Yeah, um, I mean, just to just put a finer point on that. Um, nationally, over the last two decades, the United States has lost 2,100 newspapers. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's only 50 states. <laughs> so you can see yeah. that, that, you know, it's a quarter of all newspapers. So it's not, you know, we can look out, you know, I think it's, it's important to take those national numbers and figure out what's going on here, which is what I think you're talking about. Um, there are now 1,800 communities um, that had a local news outlet in 2004 um, without any at the beginning of 2020. So, you know, seeing what's going on and wondering what the situation is in Massachusetts, I've spoken with so many people and so many really like caring um, newspaper people, um, editors, publishers, journalists. Um, and they're, you know, they have so many stories to share, but I can't do anything with those stories. You know, it's all anecdotal. It's like, oh, we used to have a paper down in that community and now somebody's trying to do an online thing. And it's like, well, is that a news desert? <laughs> is that not? I mean, like, I really want, I think the the study part of this, and the, and I should say there's two, two parts of this really. Um, one is just to figure out what is the situation here, have like people who are you know, we have um, geographic diversity in the final commission as well. And or at least we've tried. Um, and just to find out what the actual, you know, snapshot is here right now, I think is really important. Um, but then the second part of the duty of the commission is to figure out where we're going. Um, and to come up with a report. And this is a short-term commission. It's all over by August 1st. Um, but oh, to, come yeah. with, you know, to come up with a report on, you know, discuss different business models that might be, you know, being experimented with around the country, around the world. Um, there are some that are working. Um, they're now succeeding and failing at about um, 50%. So half are making it, half are not. And I think there's lessons for both. Um, if something doesn't make it, it that would be good information too. Um, so to, to basically, you know, provide guidance. I mean, these are thinkers. These are people who are have a stake in this. And to just say, okay, well, you know, here's what we discussed. 
and maybe come up with here's where we should go or here's what we should consider um, and, um, and make that part of the report too. I tried not to be too prescriptive in the writing of this bill because I think it's better just to you know, see where it takes us a little bit. And I'm also not, haven't given out my own opinions on some of the things that are um, being tried elsewhere. So, um, and I'm gonna continue to do that. I'm gonna wait until the commission meets and then then we'll discuss. Um, so, um, so that's where we're at with it. It's really, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, with COVID, everything's about COVID right now and mm. the impact it's had on, you know, the newsrooms, some of them are doing okay. Um, but, you know, this, this Hussman report actually referred to it as almost an extinction level <laughs> event um, for some of the newsrooms. Um, it just like the local country's local news ecosystem just collapsed. Um, so I think the idea is before we face collapse here in Massachusetts, um, that we get in front of it and try to do something. I don't know if it can be saved, but we can certainly um, put our heads together and, and strategize a bit. Well, you've already said, and, and I certainly agree, and my colleagues do too, that this is, uh, at the end of the day, this is about democracy. You know, do we want to have a democracy? Certainly at the local level, but beyond that, I mean, all politics is local, yes, but we have a state level, we have a national level of politics and an international level too. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the games being played by major conglomerates in absorbing uh, news outlets is happening globally. It's not just here. And in fact, you know, behind uh, the gatehouse part of Gannett was a Japanese bank after three matryoshka-like levels of hedge funds. You know, it's, it's so, um, but, um, uh, and if we're talking about democracy, I suppose, um, it's, I know, I know SPJ members and, and a lot of journalists have, have the kind of obvious question with this kind of endeavor, you know, which is like, journalists strive to be independent, even though it's become very difficult since so many of us have to work for big corporations that seem more interested in the almighty dollar than they are in the, you know, in journalism in the interest of democracy. And, um, you know, how, um, for all that though, um, people do feel like journalists in general are, are trying to write, you know, as tribunes of the people, trying to represent what's going on in society, no matter how difficult it is to do that in a given outlet. So how can we um, trust government to play a role in trying to further our industry, like to, to keep it going, to maybe make it work better than it did before? Like, this is certainly something that's on people's minds. And I have an answer, but I'd like to hear your answer, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, as I was kind of thinking out loud with you earlier, you know, I didn't want this to be something where the journalists had to trust that we would be, make it better. I think this is, this is just the formation of a commission. And, you know, I, I've been very careful um, to serve merely as a facilitator. Like I mentioned before, I'm not sharing my opinions <laughs> on things, just reporting the facts and, and, and what, you know, I'm leaning heavily on the Hussman School of Journalism. That's a, a report. It's probably, it's the best report out there. It's funded by the Knight Foundation, which is doing, just funding a lot of the um, great experiments that are taking place. There's, you know, like Report for America, which is like Teach for America. There's, um, there's all kinds of really interesting models that are being tried across the country. And I think you know, I, I think as far as trusting government, I, you know, I, I think this is just a conversation and it's not, you know, it's facilitated by government and somebody, you know, somebody commented, why do we need you to facilitate this? It's like, well, nobody was doing it. So, <laughs> so I stepped up and I'm doing it. So, um, you know, I have no ax to grind in this aside from having a daughter who's a journalist and, you know, somebody who I'd like to see employed for her lifetime. Um, right. But, you know, I think, and I think that's true of everybody. I mean, th this is so nonpartisan, um, you know, everybody thinks that partisan politics messes up every, any, everything. Um, this is, this got a unanimous vote in the House. Um, the Senate, I think it was a voice vote, but it was unanimous in the House. And it's, you know, it's rare that we do things unanimously. Um, but everybody, we, you know, at the end of the day, we go back to our communities and we read our local papers because we can't be out in the community all the time. Um, and we count on, you know, sort of a, 
a voice we can trust, um, journalistic integrity. And, you know, we don't agree with all the opinions necessarily, but we're glad that there's, um, you know, paper there informing us. And, and when I say paper, it doesn't even have to be a paper. A lot of newspapers are, a lot of news outlets now are not even printing. So uh, there's a lot of online um, right. outlets now that are, are doing the um, news gathering and informing the uh, community. So, so I think, you know, and, and, and that's a useful thing to talk about too. Well, you know, what are people, do we need to print? I think, um, you know, there's a great, there's a great example out at the Berkshire Eagle Tribune where um, that paper, it's a daily, was purchased by Alden Global Capital, which is the hedge fund that's been buying up all the local papers. And um, some members of the community were not happy with the, you know, the, the way the paper had shrunk and the way news was being reported. So um, this guy, Fred Bretberg, um, got a bunch of his friends together and um, purchased it back from a hedge fund. And now he's, you know, running the paper and putting out a, you know, a decent paper, hiring journalists out of, out of journalism school um, and really, you know, showing that it can be done. And he really believes that if you put out good quality news, people pay for it. And so far that's um, proven true. So I think, you know, that, that these, and he's hopefully going to be on the commission as well. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and I think there are different things happening in different communities too. You know, we're, we're not, you know, news isn't monolithic necessarily. So what might work in, you know, out in the Berkshires may not work in Boston. Um, so that's that's another thing that we have to- We can at. try to map, you know, I mean, the commission can try to map, you know, these different <coughs> around Massachusetts as well as point. I mean, cause my own uh, nonprofit, the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism has been engaged in trying to figure out, you know, sort of how we quote unquote save local journalism, right? We have a project in Somerville going on called the Somerville News Garden with a bunch of volunteers. It's now putting out a local news service called Somerville Wire for the last month and a half. And we, you know, we do have a, uh, I have an assistant director now, Shira Lashroin, who's working with me on that project. But I mean, there are other projects around the state, you know, um, and it's it's worth, you know, looking at the different models. Essentially, like uh, between, as I said, the same three principles run the newspaper Dig Boston and the nonprofit Binge. We call this a hybrid economic model. This is purposeful on our part. It's not like an accident that the same three people run the, run the commercial newspaper, which is broke during the pandemic, by the way, and is printing catch as catch can and printing very much as a question. You know, like, why is it important? Why is it not? I won't, I don't, I need not belabor that here. But, um, but overall, we have found that as an enterprise, having a commercial newspaper and a nonprofit that are both engaged in producing news in the public interest allows us to lean alternately on one or the other side of that enterprise, depending on conditions. So four years ago, when we took over Dick Boston, Chris, John, and I were able to get our salaries, low though, low though they may be, you know, um, from the commercial side. But what happened the moment the pandemic hit officially, all the ads go away because mm -hmm. most businesses that advertise in newspapers are public facing. Mm -hmm. Guess what you can't do during a pandemic? Like you can't go to the theater, <laughs> restaurants, not so much, you know, and so on and so forth. So, um, and it took government money, by the way, for Dig and other papers like us to even get through the, you know, the early stages of the pandemic and survive. But the nonprofit was doing okay. And it took years for that to be the case. I mean, it's almost six years old now, but so, I mean, models like this, I think commission can look at and at least list off and talk about the relative merits of, of each one um, as part of, of the fact finding uh, mission of the commission. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, prescriptions, you know, for what government may do though. I mean, I think a lot of us are gonna find this especially interesting because um, and this is where we should probably talk about the New Jersey experiment, right? Because there are other models that have been proposed. Um, I, I often talk about the model, um, the National Endowment for Journalism model, but in New Jersey, um, under the auspices of the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University, um, together with other advocates like Free Press, a uh, media reform group that did work on, as advocates on, on this bill that we're discussing today here in Massachusetts, um, they created something called the New Jersey Civic Information Consortium. And do you want to talk about that a little, Representative, or should, you know, do you want um, me to? No, why don't you continue? Go ahead, Jason. Well, I mean, you know, the idea there, and, and this, 
it, it's, it's based on conditions in that state, but there's a lot that's replicable elsewhere. The idea is that, of course, nobody, and I remember saying this in testimony to the initial um, committee at the State House, uh, including some Republican members who kind of like what I was saying. I'm like, look, no journalists are looking for some Soviet style situation where government is running media and we're just like working for government any more than we like, you know, working for big corporations that don't care about journalism. I mean, neither is a good solution, right? So um, how does government fund uh, what one might call media goods? You know, things that people agree good, are, are useful for the public, uh, media that's useful for the public, that helps the public get the information they need to be engaged citizens, be it, you know, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of um, you know, uh, the economy, but also in terms of just getting information, right? Um, so we have things at the national level like a national endowment for the arts. We have the national endowment for the humanities, right? So these are pots of government money that then get dispersed by different kinds of boards, you know, essentially, um, ideally fully independent boards. And I think that's what the New Jersey project was trying to do, to have a fully independent board you know, get, uh, well, first of all, they, they got this civic information, the Center for Cooperative Media and its allies, uh, which included a lot of news organizations in the state, got state government to agree that they were gonna pass a law um, that had some money attached to it that was going to go to a new, um, a new initiative, the Civic Information Consortium, mm -hmm. and that that body would constitute an independent board, which would then disperse grants out of the state money. Right. And, and so that puts it at remove from government. They just had their first round of grants, their $35,000 grants, right. and they're, they're doing it. So, um, yeah. but you're right, they did sort of create kind of a, a firewall. And it's not like they're creating the Boston Globe or creating right. a news outlet at all. I mean, it tends to be single, um, single focus, single issue um, initiatives, um, from what I understand. Right. Um, but you know, I think I think people who are in touch with the way journalism is funded right now are are more comfortable with the idea of money coming from you know, originating from government, because there's so much of it already. Um, that's my understanding anyway. And um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's, that's how it's working. And it's a little, you know, they're doing it differently than like I would do it, or probably, you know, you would do it if, it, you know, if we were going to talk about particulars mm -hmm. uh, in terms, you know, like I'm, I'm generally more interested in thinking about journalism as journalism, as opposed to calling it like, you know, civic informatics or community informatics and thinking about delivering information to people and kind of maybe narrowing the focus of what gets funded in certain ways by topic area or whatever. But that's kind of quibbling. I mean, they've done a really interesting thing and it's, it's something, it's like one thing we can consider here in the state. Now we do actually have a question, I think, from Don Seifert, he says, um, I believe the final result of the commission will be to publish a study of local journalism and make recommendations. What I'd be interested in hearing about is once a study is in hand, what can be done at the state level to bring the recommendations about, you know, to make them happen? So, so that, that's actually, thanks for that question, Don. That's, um, that's, that's interesting because I, 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 I honestly, I don't know what the recommendations will actually look like. So it's very hard to say, you know, how, how do we make them happen? I don't know that they're going to even be dependent on state level action, you know, on government action. Some of the recommendations might be, you know, stop your printing presses or, you know, um, try this instead, or um, this didn't work at all. I've heard, um, I've heard things like um, there's a newspaper, I think in Montreal that um, took all of their customers that were getting print newspapers and gave them tablets and gave them I iPads um, and, and stop printing. I don't, I don't know if that actually worked with everybody, but that's, that's what they did. And it, it, it's how they made it work. Um, so there are things like that, that, okay, so maybe that'll be actionable at the business level. Maybe, you know, business outlets or news outlets will be able to 
you know, make that information useful to them. Um, some of the things that would involve government that I have heard about, um, the, the simplest thing, which um, like I said, I'm not um, gonna attach good or bad. I'm not advocating for anything. I'm just sharing what, what you know, I've been sort of the um, receiver of <laughs> so much information about, about this topic recently. So um, making um, subscriptions deductible up to a point. I mean, I think that's, you know, that sounds like, you know, could be easy, easier to accomplish. It doesn't involve a whole, um, and now I sound like I'm advocating again, but I think it, <laughs> Oh, well, I got one too. I could take, it's take the, the simplest, pressure off you here. The simplest. And then, you know, the whole idea of a grant program, which we, we had just mm -hmm. discussed, I think is um, a little bit more elaborate. Um, but maybe, um, you know, if these are ideas that involve, uh, you know, um, a bill to be filed and something to be passed, um, you know, it'll be handy to have government involved in the commission, um, the chairs of the committee where it would would go will be um, chairing this commission. Um, so, and I, I look forward to being involved and um, there are senators that will be involved as well. So, um, you know, I think, I think the action will depend on what the report says and who needs to step up and do something. But I think the fact that it's taking place, you know, that these discussions, they're all gonna be public. Um, everybody will be able to access the meetings of the commission. Um, there are so many people who might not be on the commission officially, but want to stay engaged. So there will be a way that everybody can attend if they want to. Um, discussions will be interesting, I have no doubt, because I've had so many discussions with so many people already. There's a lot of energy behind this, and there's actually um, some national interest in the conversation that is about to unfold. So. Right. Um, so we'll have to see where it goes. There's also, there's a, there is a national bill filed. Um, Cicilline from Rhode Island, I believe, um, is trying to save journalism. And I think he, I think he might even have included in his bill, um, the subscription idea. So, um, and, and a lot of other things. Um, and you, you may have also heard what's going on in Australia, where they are yeah. trying to get um, Google and Facebook to um, pony up because they're, that's where all the dollars, all the dollars that used to support journalism are, are now in their pockets. So um, yeah, we didn't discuss discuss the structural stuff a lot today. I mean, and I, I think people watching this who are journalists at least tend to know this stuff. But it's worth mentioning, you know, that certainly commercial newspapers, you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago were dependent on a kind of a a tripod of, of income, you know, display advertising, classified advertising, and legal notices. Well, all that's left now, really, for many, many publications is like legal notices and like a little bit of display ads. But the, yeah, Google and the other major social media companies just ate that lunch right up, like early on Craigslist originally ate the classified ads. That's kind of changed now. But yeah, that those funding streams went away, and then these these major social media companies came to all the news organizations organizations like, hey, why don't you come online? You know, come into our, come to Facebook, come to Twitter, and bring your audiences with you. And yeah, now we're going to make you pay to reach your audiences that you just brought to us, suckers. You know, and this is something that has not been dealt with, you know, um, legislatively, really at any level. I mean, these companies are very powerful, first of all, and second of all. Um, there are a lot of issues with what, again, what should government do with social media companies? Mm -hmm. Are they news outlets? I mean, are they kind of like the newspapers that they've crushed? Mm -hmm. the, these are all open questions. Again, I mean, I have opinions on this, but I don't think that th this particular commission necessarily will get deep into that stuff, but it's in the background. It's, it's mm -hmm. the reason why we're, we're, we are where we are, mm -hmm. um, along with trends in local news that were you know somewhat separate from that big process mm -hmm. i mean it's not like things just stand still that we were already in a situation where cities and towns that used to have two or three local publications were down to one even as these conglomerates marched in it, it wasn't just like everything was perfect and wonderful uh, or that every every news outlet was so great you know always we, i don't think any of us want to give that impression but for all the faults of the of the system we had, you know, we haven't really replaced it with anything at the local level, certainly. And, you know, I think um, 
you know, st there, there, is, there are specific things government can do like the ones you were just mentioning. I, I'm certainly gonna bring up the legal notices system again. You know, I, I think that's ripe for, um, for, for legislative um, action. Um, right now, because of antiquated uh, legislation, antiquated language, you know, uh, in state law, only certain kinds of pre-existing old school newspapers can get legal notice money, you know, at the state and local level. So that, that language has to be rewritten. Like, what about online only news outlets? And if the state is gonna, if we're gonna, you know, if the commission comes out with a report saying, hey, you should really think about being more digital than you all are or whatever. Um, and yet we still have these old laws on the book saying, oh yeah, but um, there's this pot of state money, there's pots of local money for legal notices that must be published in news outlets, but you can't have any of it, <laughs> you know, like that, that would be kind of silly, right? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, um, the, the, the internet changed everything, <laughs> but um, it took a while. But it, the internet was there for a while affecting journalism and the news business before Facebook really took off. I mean, I think newspapers were struggling. Do we charge putting our, you know, they, and then they sort of let the toothpaste out of the tube at one point, and it's really hard to get it back in, just giving it all away for well, free. I mean, um, Google, even before, you know, Facebook and Twitter and other social media companies, you know, arrived on the scene, was already able to say to advertisers, hey, why do some display ad that like random people are gonna see we, when we can target grant, you know, in a very granular way to the specific individuals mm -hmm. that want the thing that you have to sell and only that thing. Mm -hmm. That's hard to compete with, right? Even though it turns out it didn't quite work like that. And, and you know, it's hard to compete with, but it's also really bad for democracy. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're just reading the opinions we want to hear. We're well, siloed um, by Facebook and by, you know, the internet in general. Um, and it's, it's just really bad for democracy. No, it's I, true. That kind of signal that you get from, yeah. like, if a company knows that you want to see certain kinds of ads, well, they can also infer things and do about your opinions on matters. And that leads to siloing. Yeah, right. absolutely. Right. And, you know, for somebody who wants to hear other opinions and wants to be informed, it's, it's not only getting harder to find both opinions sometimes, but it, it's, it's getting, um, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it, it, the, the um, it, it's hard to tell what the truth is sometimes too. You know, I think there's a lot of, uh, I hate to use this term, but there is a lot of fake news that's being peddled as real news. Um, not so much in Massachusetts, but there, th this is a, an actual effort. Um, the New York Times did a big piece about it at one point a few months ago, um, where local news um, papers, or they seem like local news sources really aren't. They're well-funded opinion um, pieces. And they have, um, you know, they, they'll interview somebody and then push this, um, you know, f fake news out into local news outlets. And it's really hard to tell what the truth is for somebody who, you know, I'm well informed uh, and I even struggle sometimes. Um, and, you know, journalists are human too. Um, you guys need good sources as well. So I am, um, you know, I don't know. I, th I think it is important that we grapple with, with, the many issues around this, and it does come back to democracy and the the fabric of our communities. Yeah, I mean, it was one very fun thing about this process thus far. I mean, the, the, the legislative process leading up to the point of having a commission was that there was a lot more communication between you know politicians and journalists than I recall seeing ever. And it was very unusual when I wrote about this, like um, to, to pull together dozens of journalists and journalism students and journalism professors around the state to like lobby for something in effect you know that that was strange for a lot a lot of us you know um you're, you're behaving but, like a grassroots group <laughs> yeah and i mean i i happen to have that background you know in my life but i've tried to sort of you know kind of be an advocate then be a journalist and be an advocate you're know, like not at the same time you know like so but this is kind of how bad it's it's gotten right um, uh, but I am hopeful um, that that uh, uh, 
well, I think it's always helpful when people understand each other, especially people that are legislating, you know, um, on, on critical issues that affect everybody's daily lives in a society and the people that are trying to, um, you know, cover that in the public interest to telegraph what's happening in the legislature for, you know, uh, uh, critically or favorably or whatever, you know, but like getting that information out there so that people can have an idea like where they want to go politically, you know, like, are, are they happy with this legislation? Are they not happy? Do they want to replace politicians? Do they want to keep them, you know? Um, no, so, you, I mean, there's a great line. Um, my Senate partner in this was Senator Brendan Crichton, who lives in Lynn. And Brendan, it was a quote he gave to one of the articles um, talking about this bill. He said, my constituents should not be getting their news from my Facebook feed. <laughs> right. And that's, I thought that was really self-aware <laughs> for somebody in politics. I mean, I think we benefit, you know, it, I, I think, you know, you know, somebody, I don't know, we benefit from different opinions as a society. And it makes, you know, it makes, it makes me better able to serve my constituents if they're, if they're hearing different opinions and getting truth, um, ground truth. We really, we've lost our ability to really figure out what is actually the truth. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, that's always a balancing act. And, and this, the, this commission is going to have a balancing act before it because, and this already came up in testimony on, on the bill early on from Republicans, especially you know, kind of like, well, how do I know that you're not just like getting state sponsorship for, for fake news by my lights, mm. right? Like, you know, your, your truth could be my fake news, right? right. Essentially, right? And I, I, even when I look at, at uh, initiatives like the New Jersey, um, you know, um, uh, Civic Information Consortium, I, you know, and I'm on the left, I'm very much on the left, I'm left of the Democrats. I mean, and I write about this, you know, in terms of my own politics, on, on some issues at least, and with the Democrats and other issues. But like, I was a little hesitant at kind of the creep in of kind of liberal foundation speak into the sort of um, filters that the uh, New Jersey project is using to determine who's gonna get the money. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure those filters are gonna be fair to um, news organizations that are professional by, by everybody's standards. Um, that would even meet the test, which New Jersey actually uses, of the SPJ's own code of, of ethic, you know, of ethics, right? Um, code of conduct, you know, as journalists. Um, but I, I do worry um, that we're going to tilt a little bit too far toward, like, you know, um, saying, well, um, yeah, you you right leaning publication, uh, you know, do do journalism as we understand it, but you know, you're not meeting certain diversity like requirements that we have, or you're not doing this or that thing, that kind of the more liberal leaning foundation world. And certainly a lot of people that work for projects like the New Jersey project believe in, which I also believe in, but I mean, like, where are we going to draw these lines, you know, as a, as a Commonwealth, mm -hmm. right. Um, and how, how will we have a board if we're going to disperse money like they're doing in New Jersey at some point in Massachusetts, that is going to be fair to different kinds of news organizations that you know may not all do what funders in the foundation space typically want, mm -hmm. right? I don't right. know. I mean, it's, I, but I'm already thinking about this stuff. <laughs> the commission hasn't even started yet. You know? um, so I see. Um, I, we have one more question, um, Donald Seifert. Um, thank you. For question. I'm getting blurry as the sun is going down. My apologies for everybody who's tuning in. Um, <clears throat> is the commission also going to look into underserved racial communities? Yes. Getting a diverse newsroom can vary, can, can be very, very difficult for small local papers and news sites and getting more minorities involved in journalism early on would be a big help. I, I completely agree. Um, the, we tried to give thought to um, this exact topic in uh, the makeup of the commission. And then, um, you know, there's diversity also among the members um, that may be in other categories. So, you know, it's not always, it's not always best to categorize, categorize people, but we wanted to make sure that the makeup of the commission reflected um, the need for diversity. Um, you know, I think, uh, 
you know, journalism hasn't been diverse. Um, the history leading up to now um, has, has not really reflected um, the makeup of our communities. So I think it's a very important thing to do. Um, we have membership in the commission um, from the Boston Association of Black Journalists, um, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, um, the Asian American Journalists Association of New England. And um, beyond um, those three members, there are also some people who will be involved um, who you know, are just, um, would probably fit into those categories um, if we need to fit people into categories, but um, they're just incredibly talented and motivated um, journalists already. So I, I completely agree with you. I think um, I want the commission to reflect the community um, as well as, um, you know, the, the people who tune in to watch the goings on of this commission, um, I hope will see themselves reflected back at them. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate the question. So I'm um, just getting about time to wrap up. Uh, Representative, you have any closing thoughts? Just um, you know, I I I, I feel that um, this is entirely constructive, and um, I have also a pretty good sense that we're going to have fascinating conversations ahead. Um, I don't think that this is going to be like here's our report, all your problems are solved. Mm -hmm. that, that is not at all what um, any of us had in mind. And if you look at the Hussman School reports, I think they've done four of them now. And like I said, each one is a snapshot. Um, unfortunately, the trends have not been good. Um, hopefully we can be a snapshot and then maybe if we do another one of these reports in a year or two, we can say, well, we've made progress or wow, we tried that and it really didn't work. Um, you know, I think, I, think it, I think it's the beginning of a conversation. So I just, um, I, I offer that only to say, don't think that we're gonna solve everything. Um, you don't want me to solve everything. And, and I don't think the commission has been tasked with that, but I think it, it, the snapshot's important and the conversation will be constructive. And who knows, maybe we will come up with something that um, has a meaningful impact in um, you know, making sure that our communities have access to local news. Well, Representative Laurie Ehrlich, thanks so much for coming on um, this uh, uh, fun conversation, uh, this fun uh, uh, 101 session on the Mass uh, Journalism Commission law that's just been passed and the commission's about to be enacted. This is all great. Uh, on behalf of the Society of Professional Journalists, uh, I'm, I'm Jason Framus. I just wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. And if you have any further questions, um, you know, be sure to leave comments on social media and, and folks from SPJ will get back to you and, and we'll certainly inform the representative staff if there's anything that you, know, you wanna hear from her um, uh, more than we've covered tonight. So thanks a lot, folks. Bye.